All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to another attorney lecture series. And this would normally be the time of the year that we would have our open house and celebrate our opening. This year is actually our 32nd anniversary of the Fort Bend County Law Library. Unfortunately, with the rise in COVID cases and everything else, we want to be safe and try to make this as as easy as possible for everybody. So we did make this a virtual program, but we still want to be able to offer you all your CLE credit and the information you need to, uh, you know, run a successful practice. So welcome everybody. Our speaker today is Carrie Graham, who we've welcomed back. This is her second attorney lecture series, and we appreciate her being here and sharing her knowledge and expertise with us. Um, you know, she's very well respected and knowledgeable in her field and actually just recently won a uh, 2022 uh, rising attorney from Texas Monthly. So uh, thank you very much for being here, Carrie, and go and take it away. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for those who have your cameras on. It's nice to see faces. It's nice to see faces anytime now with the pandemic and all the isolation. So. Um, it's always good to see Jonathan and Andrew. Appreciate the invite. So I was asked to talk a little bit today about guardianship. I'm gonna, can I go ahead and share my screen? Is that okay? Perfect. Go right in. So I've got, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. It's asking me a question. I'm gonna share my screen. If anyone wants the PowerPoint, I have my email on the next. I can get it to run. You know what I just realized is some days I feel super old. I have three screens and I don't know how to work them all. Um, does that look right, Andrew? Looks good to me. You can see? Okay. All right. Just share. So on my second screen, um, I'm just going to give you my email address. So if we, if you get through today and you want anything that I've talked about or any notes or forms or Sample testimony. I have all of that and I am happy to share it, but my email is here for you. So please feel free to take that down. Um, that is my office number. If you want my cell number, email me and um, I will email you my cell numbers too so that you can talk with me. It's quite easier to get me on my cell. I'm going to talk a little bit about guardianship. I've practiced guardianship and guardianship litigation for 10 years. My office is in Katy, so we have a little trifecta that happens out here. So we're partly Harris, uh, partly Fort Bend, partly Waller. A large part of my practice is in Fort Bend County. Um, it's a great place to practice. There's lots of great support out there. Um, but when when people file for guardianship, a lot of times um, it's so check the box that if you're a general practitioner, it can be frustrating to deal with the courts because your case can get hung up if you have the tiniest box left unchecked. And so I designed this program so that if you are an attorney or if you are a person who is at part of a guardianship case, the steps are laid out really clear in a step-by-step -step fashion. And so that's why I say, if you want the PowerPoint, um, all the steps are in here in order with the code sections so that if you need to reference something or look, look it up, I'm hoping that's helpful to you. But the thing where I like to start with folks is understanding that guardianship is a lawsuit. And a lot of times when we, when we, begin a guardianship proceeding, we're doing it because someone has either lost their capacity or we're doing it because we have a special needs child or we're doing it because another adult who's vulnerable has had someone take advantage of them. And so we, we often start it from a very good place and we lose sight of the fact that a guardianship is a lawsuit against the person that we love, that we are asking the court to take away their constitutional rights and to confer it on another person. And because we come from this loving, great place so many times when we file a guardianship, we can get frustrated by why the court requires all of these things. And so I like to start with that basic idea that you're asking the court to take away someone's constitutional rights. And in the United States of America, we do not do that lightly, but in Texas, we do it it's even harder. And in light of some of the shows that have come out, I mean, these documentaries on guardianships gone wrong, these courts are under heavy, heavy criticism. And what a lot of folks don't know is that the judges have personal liability for who they appoint and how these estates are administered. And so when we 
kind of start from understanding that it is a really big deal, it makes it easier to tolerate the boxes that we have to check. And so I think understanding that perspective is really important. And so let's start with some of the basic ideas. Um, understanding kind of who is who is a big deal. So the text of the state's code lays out what the definition of incapacity is. So it's interesting to think about the fact that an incapacitated person can be someone who's just not 18 yet. That in and of itself is an incapacity because a minor can't contract if they inherit, say, part of a house, they can't just go sell that house because they don't have capacity to sign a contract. And so we might have to go to the court and ask the court to help us do those things and get the court to oversee a process for a minor. It's also defined as an adult who is substantially unable to provide food, clothing, or shelter for their own self or to provide for their physical health or to manage their affairs. And that, that word substantial is interesting because it's really not heavily defined. Um, it, the court has discretion to understand what substantial and what, what is substantial and how it's defined. And then it tells us that a person who must have a guardian appointed to receive funds from any governmental source. And so if we wanna apply for Medicaid, for example, if we wanna get social security disability, there are steps that we have to take sometimes, not all times in a guardianship to have limited authority to do things with the federal government. I was in a small town courthouse about four weeks ago, and I represented a, a nephew of an incapacitated adult, and there's a guardianship contest pending. And the judge looked at us and said, well, I don't know if you guys have standing. And, and I said, but your honor, the code says it's any interested person. So one thing that's different about guardianship is that anyone who cares is allowed to come to the courthouse and seek relief and protection for someone they care about. And that there, there's some standing rules to it, but it's, it's a very different perspective to say, well, anybody can come here and ask for a guardianship. It's great because not everyone has family, but it's also scary because a bad person can also decide they wanna step in and be a guardian. But the code says an interested person includes an heir, a devisee, so someone who receives something under a will, a spouse, a creditor, or any person having a property right or a claim against an estate. That can be like, if someone owes me money and I wanna recover that money or I have a claim, right? That's gonna be an interested person. And it can also be a person who just is interested in someone else's welfare. So it's a very low threshold to get to the courthouse in a guardianship, which is nice. You don't have to too carefully vet your clients as far as whether or not they're interested. It also defines a proposed word, so talk about that word a lot. So until you are a ward, and there's a lot of legislation pending right now to change that word because it sounds so sterile and people don't like it. I mean, it, it sounds like you're a ward of the state, right? People get pretty confused about what that means. Um, so that word's probably going to change, but for now we call the person we're suing in the guardianship, the proposed ward, and that's the person that we allege has an incapacity of some kind due to their age, their inability to care for themselves, or they've fallen prey to someone else. And then we have the ward is the person whom the guardianship is established. So once the guardianship is established and a guardian is appointed, we change it from the proposed ward to the ward. And that's important when you're drafting documents. You don't want to apply and call someone a ward when they've not yet been determined judicially to be incapacitated. So probably the most important thing I could ever tell you is read the book. The probate Bible is really, really important. The code does lay it out. Um, I always tell folks when I was a new lawyer, um, about six months into my practice, I had been reading the O'Connor's Texas Estates Code, and I never looked at the front of the book. And then one day I looked at the front of the book, not on purpose, it was just random. So I look at the front of the book and I realized that every step for every type of probate case is actually in the front of the book. And so it will lay out where you start every possible option, and it even tells you optional. So it's pretty awesome. So if you are starting to get into this area of law, um, the one thing that I think is really helpful in the O'Connors is the front table that tells you every step. And so you can kind of make sure that you've covered it. Um, when I was, you know, a baby and learning how to do these things and not spending a lot of money, I photocopy that part of the code. It's probably illegal. I don't know. Probably broke the law. Just realized I said that to librarians. <laughs> did I plagiarize? <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah, you did. Um, and I would check it off for each case just to make sure 
Um, I please forget I said that. Never mind. Read the code. Book. Copying the book is not really? illegal. Okay, good. <laughs> It's, her, it's, it's English, using it and saying it's your own is the illegal <laughs> part. <laughs> okay, good. I feel so much better about myself. I'm get, learning some things today. So when we talk about guardianship, there's two different ways um, that we can form a guardianship. And they are, even if applied for together, they are treated separate. So we can have a guardianship over the person. That's someone who's going to make medical decisions, decide where you live. And then we have guardianship over the estate. And a lot of folks will come to me and say, well, you know, I don't really have an estate. That's what you really do. And a, a state is going to include anything in your name. So even something as minor as a lease on a, an apartment or a lease on a car, those things make up your estate. Getting income, Social Security income, getting TRS income, railroad retirement, work, income from a job, right? Th that is an estate. Any asset that might be in your name, an inheritance, even if it's not been titled, in someone's name, all counts, oil rights, leases, all of these things are what create an estate. And so anytime there's an estate, we have to either find an alternative to guardianship to manage it, or we have to utilize guardianship uh, to manage it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I like to start um, after we talk about kind of the foundation of who's who and what's what, what do you do when that person walks in your door and they sit down and they start asking you, what do I need? Well, I think the client interview and a guardianship is really important. It does a couple of things. It helps the client understand that it's a big deal what they're doing. And then it helps them walk through any hiccups that might come into the case, things the court's gonna ask about that maybe they don't know to tell you. And then third, I think it sets expectations so that they can understand what's going to happen and be less frustrated, which of course protects us because we don't like the state bar to ever hear our name. Right, we always want to make sure we're protected. So a couple of little tips, um, talk to the client, make sure you're not talking to the proposed ward. So if Jack brings in his mom, Beth, and Beth is in the room, you are talking to your opposing party. We understand that in civil litigation, if you're an attorney, you know that's bad. But with guardianship, you might be talking to the husband who's been taking care of his wife for 50 years and she's incapacitated and she might be in the room and you may not realize you're really breaching an ethical violation. So it's really important to make sure that when you are doing this interview and you're talking this case, that person is not in the room with you and that you're not breaching something that someone, you don't want your attorney ad litem eventually to go, wait a minute, you talked to my client? What do you mean they were in your office? Because again, it feels friendly and many times no one will care, but the day they care is, and the day you've done something wrong, is the day you have a problem. And so we just wanna make sure we're still walking those ethical lines and keeping in mind the person you're suing, the proposed ward is not your client and you should not interact with them. And second, you're gonna to wanna to talk to the client about least restrictive alternatives. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you wanna have a good conversation with them because you're gonna need testimony. And some of the courts are really particular why why don't you have this? Why isn't there a power of attorney? What happened to it? So we want to make sure that we're talking about with our client and we know the answer and we're not surprised when we go to the courthouse. You also want to make sure you ask about any diagnosis the proposed ward may have, medication they might be taking, um, do they have better parts of the day than others? Um, and then a really key factor is to make sure if you're talking about a special needs adult, and both parents are alive and they are either married or have served as joint managing conservators that both of them apply. Um, I had a case went all the way up through an appeal, okay, where mom was deaf and she resigned in favor of dad because of her disability. And y'all, it forever prohibited her from coming back because those, those Prodox waivers, if that's what you're using, they are waiving in favor of the other person. And we don't like that. We don't want a parent to lose standing with, in a guardianship. So if you can get both parents on the front end, you really want to do that. Plus it saves them money down the road if something happens to one parent. And we'll talk about the role of the attorney ad litem, but when they get involved, if they get to their client and they know both parents are working with them, they, they may come ask you. And you're going to have to amend your application because it's best for their client to have both parents involved. And then obviously you want to explain the process of guardianship 
and you want to make sure you talk on the front end about language barriers. If your proposed ward only speaks Spanish or Mandarin or any other language, you need to tell the court. They can appoint an attorney ad litem who speaks the language so that you don't need an interpreter for the, the interview process and the, the client contact process. And then you need to tell the court immediately as the applicant attorney, I have a Mandarin speaking client. I am going to need an interpreter and follow the court's policy. Fort Bend does a great job, um, and some, some of the courts really do a great job at making sure you have an interpreter available to you, but they cannot give you what you don't ask for. So make sure that you're talking with them if you have a language barrier. And I, I, I usually tell people if you've got um, bilingual folks and they don't understand legal terms, you want to make sure you use an interpreter because it, you don't want them to come back and say, I didn't understand. No one provided this for me. So let's talk about lesser restrictive alternatives. So you are required now to seek lesser restrictive alternatives to guardianship. Guardianship is a restrictive, it's a restrictive situation, especially if there's any asset involved. And so we're required to talk to our folks about what is something we could do that would avoid the need for a guardianship. And so here's a kind of a non-exclusive list. A medical power of attorney is lesser restrictive and you don't have to have a thousand percent capacity to sign one of those. You just have to know who this person is and, and understand the implications of letting them make medical decisions for you. A financial power of attorney, a little harder, got to have contractual capacity. That's a different day conversation. But if there is one and it's working, you don't need a guardianship of the estate. Um, some folks really like the declaration for mental health treatment, which says, I have a mental health problem. If I'm bipolar and I have a psychi psychiatric, psychiatric break, I can sign a document that says if I'm committed to West Park Springs, the doctor can evaluate me and decide I need treatment and give it to me without my consent while I'm unable to make my own decisions. There's also, through Social Security, you can become a representative payee in lieu of having a guardianship of the estate. So that's really nice. And you can have a joint bank account. If you can pay bills, you may not need the court to supervise that for you. We can use a management trust. So section 1301 of the estates code provides that you can create a trust which does not have the same high level requirements in getting court permission to spend money. So it costs less. Great for minors, great for disabled adults. We love them. Um, make sure you know your court when you're doing them and make sure you know the code because not, not every person is going to be familiar with that 1301. So I have a little memorandum I use and send out uh, if, I, if I don't know the attorney I'll buy them or I'm not sure about the court. Can you use a special needs trust? We can look to designation of guardians. If someone has said in writing when they did their will, maybe they signed a paper that says, I designate my favorite daughter Sue to be my guardian in the event that I need one. Right, because sometimes people have everything in place. Maybe they have that power of attorney, but they have the wee body dementia and they got angry at their kid one day and they shredded it, right? Now we got a problem. So, so looking at those documents is really um, important. And then for our special needs folks, there are some other person-centered planning documents we can do. This is my mom, she's gonna attend my visits and she's gonna help me make decisions. You can talk to her. Um, I'll tell you, I, I'm not a huge fan of those because I feel like if you can sign that, you could probably sign a medical power of attorney and there's nothing in our law that says that you can't. Um, so I'm not, I don't personally use those as any type of go-to, but some attorneys really love them. So let's talk a little bit about standing. We talked about this a little bit at the, the beginning. If it is a minor, if we're talking about a kid who is under the age of 18 and inheriting property. Uh, interesting note. You cannot bring guardianship for a minor if one of the parents is alive. You have to go to the family court. So this is a situation where either the minor has no living parents or they've inherited some sort of property. So it happens a lot in a blended family. Mom or dad are married. They have kids from other relationships. Mom or dad dies. Now the kid owns part of that house because there's no will and child can't contract. So we need a guardianship. So when we look at who can come to the courthouse for a child, it's a husband and wife who are married. It's a joint managing conservator. So if you are a, a JMC under a divorce decree, you can do it. A biological parent, a person who's named in a designation for the minor child, 
the nearest of kin or a qualified person. So again, anybody, but certain people have priority over others. If it's not for a minor, the first person who can come to the courthouse is someone designated to do so in that designation of guardianship. Second is a spouse, third is a child, four is the nearest of kin, and then last again is that eligible person. The eligible person doesn't trump, automatically trump a spouse, a child, or someone designated, but they can if that person proves to be adverse. And then let's talk a little bit about venue, because sometimes you can, you can shop a venue a little bit. Um, venue is mandatory in the county where the proposed ward resides, where their estate is mostly located, like where they own a house or have an asset, or where they're located that day. So if I've got a kid who lives here, in fact, I have this situation right now, mama who's incapacitated, lived in San Antonio, sold her house, bought a million dollar house in Florida and ran to Florida, I'm like get her back here for a day. She owns a house here, get her here for a day. Let's file here where you are. So you can venue shop a little bit. Um, and the code does allow for that, which is kind of nice. Now, if it's a minor, it's permissive where both parents live, where a sole managing conservator lives, or the county where a deceased parent of that minor used to live. So again, you can venue shop. And I think the reason, I don't always understand the legislature, but to me, this makes sense because you're trying, usually have good people doing good work on this planet when they file a guardianship. And this makes it easier for them so that if I'm here and someone's in, you know, my family's in Bayer County, it's not convenient for me to go to the courthouse. So allowing it to happen in a closer venue is really beneficial. Um, jurisdiction, guardianship proceedings have to be filed in a court of original probate jurisdiction and note that related matters can be pulled over from other places. So if there's an eviction pending, family court matters, a divorce, anything like that, guardianship court can suck it up and hear all of those things at once. It's judicially efficient. And sometimes it can be great because other courts that don't understand guardianship sometimes make mistakes. So getting our, our probate judges to look at it can be very helpful. Not that they wanna be family law judges, right? But sometimes it's helpful to have it all at once. And then next is a statutory probate court, a county court at law, which is Fort Bend County, or a county court who's been granted authority to do so. So let's kind of walk through the steps of guardianship. First step is to file an application a civil case information sheet if the county you're in requires it. The PCME, which is a doctor's assessment, it's a physician's certificate of medical exam and a motion in order to appoint an attorney ad litem. And then don't forget to have request. Sometimes you need a separate request for the clerk to publish notice. And yes, those should all be filed at one time. You need to file them all so the court sees them all together. Um, and then again, if you have a language barrier, I would usually put that in my motion in order to appoint an attorney ad litem, put a statement that the proposed ward only speaks Spanish or something like that, then call the court. Don't, don't not communicate with them, they need to know. Second, um, in Fort Bend County, we don't have investigators because we're not statutory probate courts, but every court's gonna appoint an attorney ad litem to represent the uh, wishes of the proposed ward. So note that it's not best interest for the pro proposed ward. The attorney ad litem is there to represent what that person wants, even if it's crazy. Even if they say, I want someone who will take me to Burger King every single day, that, that attorney is gonna be appointed to say their wishes to the court so the court can be aware. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the attorney ad litem in a second, but what I'll tell you at this point is communicate with that person very specifically and make sure you send them unredacted pleadings. They can't get the information if it's all blocked out. So keep in mind that there's protected information in these applications, the courts are gonna, or the clerks are gonna block it out. So make sure that you send them all the things they need to know. Unredacted pleadings, where the proposed board is located, who to contact to get in touch with them, especially now during COVID, any COVID rules, and then your client's name and contact information. Frequently, I will tell the attorney ad litem, you have permission to speak with my client without me present so that they know. They do have permission, you don't have to grant it, but I like someone to feel very comfortable reaching out and talking to my client. 
Third step is to serve the proposed ward in its only constable service. So you have to order your citation through the clerk and then the constable will do it. Now, right now, constables are like picking up on Tuesdays and dropping off on Fridays. They're not serving over the weekends and they make a lot of mistakes. So when they're serving the proposed ward, you need to make sure your client knows if, if your person lives with you at home or they're in a facility, this paperwork has to touch their body. You can't get it, the facility can't get it, the nurse can't grab it. It's even if they are unconscious on the bed, that paperwork has to be placed on their body because we are not taking their rights away without giving them proper notice. And if you show up at court and that, that return does not say, I personally served it to Mrs. Smith, you're not having a hearing and your client's gonna be very, very frustrated. Step four is notice. So we are required to tell certain people that you have filed for this guardianship. And the code lays it out. It's every adult child. So if the, if the proposed ward has kids and they are over 18, they're all entitled to notice. Each adult sibling of the proposed ward gets notice. The parents of the proposed ward get notice. If they are living in a care or residential facility, the administrator or operator is entitled to notice. That's the one people forget. Anyone serving under a power of attorney is entitled to notice. Anyone designated to serve as guardian is entitled to notice. And then if there's no parents, siblings, or children of the proposed ward, every adult within the third degree by consanguinity is entitled to notice. So green card notice is hard right now. Office postmen are not delivering green cards. So I've not been doing green card notice. So far I've had no issues with this. I have been doing um, FedEx proof of delivery where FedEx sends me back the proof. I've been using those instead because I can reliably get that. Most green cards are not being pulled or they're putting C-19 on the back because the postman's not able to get to folks. And so a little side note, if you're using green cards successfully, that's awesome. I've had a horrible luck and I don't want my client paying me to send out a bunch of stuff. So I've been doing FedEx so far. No one's complained, so don't tell any judges that I do it that way. And then you sign an affidavit that you did it, and you attach all of your returns, and then you you file that with the court. So a couple of notice issues. So anyone over the age of 12 is entitled to personal service. Um, otherwise, the parent or conservator can actually accept service on a child under 12. We're not really gonna put a three-year-old in front of an officer. That, that kind of makes sense. But a 12 year old's old enough to read it and under, maybe understand a little bit. So if you're 12 and older, you get the personal service. Um, next step is to coordinate your hearing with the court. So making sure that your applicant is available, the attorney ad litem is available, the proposed ward is available if their attorney wants them there. And of course, getting on the court's docket. So I usually do a notice of hearing on these things and then send it to my client just to sort of CYA for me to make sure everybody's been noticed. Um, but you do wanna make sure that you've coordinated it and kept it friendly with uh, all the parties. Step six is to qualify. So once you're appointed guardian by the court, you then have to qualify. You don't qualify on the day that you, because of COVID right now, we used to be able to qualify that day by signing our oath and filing it, if it's just a guardianship of the person, we can't do that anymore because we're, we're by Zoom. So now your qualification date can be anywhere from four, 10, 12 days later. The judge signs the order. We have to wait for the clerk to scan it in. Once it's scanned in, then you can sign the oath with your client that are promised not to do anything naughty. Then we file that. Then a qualification date is issued. Um, in a guardianship, there are also two different types of bonds. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the estate bond right now. If you have issues with that, we'll definitely can do that at another time. It's just a little bit more involved. Um, but in order to qualify, most courts will, will do a $100 cash bond. Or if it's the biological parents, they might do $10 each parent. That is cash or attorney check only. That is the only way it can be paid. And you don't qualify until you've paid that. Now, once um, your guardianship is terminated because maybe that person's restored or they die, you can go back and get that cash, but you do have to put that cash down as your promise to take care of that person. 
So we're going to talk a little bit now about attorney ad litems, which are either the biggest blessing or the biggest curse that you're going to experience as is in the entire guardianship process, in my opinion. I really recommend reading Judge King's ad litem manual. Uh, two reasons. One is because it will explain to you what the ad litem does in the process and what they don't do. So that if you have a crazy ad litem, you can rein them in. And second, it gives a lot of code sections. So if you run into an unruly judge or an unruly ad litem, you have the case law right there that explains what their job is. Okay. So we all know, probably know now that judges don't get just to appoint attorneys that they like or believe in. They have to have a wheel and they have to go down that wheel. Now there's some great things about this, right? We love this for new attorneys. If you're a new attorney and you've not done guardianship, you should try to get on a wheel because you will learn so much from the applicant attorneys. You will make friends to call when you need help. That's awesome. But if you're an applicant attorney and you get a bad ad litem or someone who's not willing to learn or goes wild crazy, that's bad. And then it can also turn into some really ugly court hearings when they're asking all kinds of uncomfortable or inappropriate questions. Um, I was in court, not my case one day, but um, heard an ad litem asking the divorced yet still wonderfully co-parenting biological parents about the terms of their divorce and all the ugliness. It was absolutely atrocious. No one needed to know that, especially the, the sweet little special needs kid that was getting a guardianship that day. And so making sure you um, know who you got and what they do is going to be really helpful to you. So the the role of the attorney ad litem is spelled out. So the attorney, the attorney ad litem has certain jobs, and I think it's helpful for your client to know this. They need to review everything. So when you bill your client to collect the pleadings and send it out, right, that's required. They are going to, they're going to review the order appointing them to see if there's anything special in there. They're, we're going to review the application, the physician's certificate of medical exam, which needs to be dated within, a, uh, I think it's four months within filing. Sometimes I forget to check that and have to look at the code, right? I think it's 120 days. They're going to look at any medical or financial records. So they can go to the bank with their order and look at this person's bank account, make sure there's been nothing nefarious going on in that account, no abuse, no neglect. They're also going to file an answer. Now, this is the one that I tell my clients about. Because when the attorney at litem files an answer, they're going to file a general denial that says, this guardianship should be denied. And if you have a really crazy attorney at litem, they're going to not realize they can just send that to you as the attorney. They're going to send it to your client by certified mail. And then your client is going to call you and say, why are they denying my case? What is happening right here? So prepare your client. You might see this. It's standard for them to say no. It doesn't mean it's not, not friendly. It's just required for them to say, prove your case, right? You have to prove your case and carry the burdens that guardianship requires. Then they're going to want to meet with that proposed ward and they're going to want to meet with them without the applicant. And so make sure your client knows like, hey, if you're in a facility, you might need to reserve a room because you may not be able to meet in, in a, you know, the, the proposed ward's uh, bedroom. So make sure you're kind of facilitating that process, preparing them for them, someone else being alone with maybe their down syndrome kiddo, right? Who still has the mentality of a seven-year-old. And then that attorney ad litem is gonna go through all those other lesser restrictive alternatives and make sure that there's nothing that would avoid the need for guardianship. They're also gonna look at other supports and services that are available. Do we really need a guardianship if Medicaid allows for you to apply for certain benefits for your adult disabled child? No. So they may look at those things and ask a lot of questions. Um, they're gonna review any proposed orders. They're gonna check waivers and notices, make sure that you did your job. And then they're going to come to the hearing and ask questions of your client. So pray for a good attorney ad litem. They really are priceless. And if you ever run into something crazy, I've actually had to remove a couple. So if you run into some issues, let me know. A good solution I have found is to say, hey, it seems like you're a little bit new at this. I'm gonna send you this manual that tells you how to do your job. Hugs and kisses me, right? So sending them the manual sometimes really helps. So some practical tips if you are applying as the attorney, communicate with your attorney ad litem, help them if they are new. Um, I think one of the nicest things you make, nicest ways you make friends is to help folks. I've been attorney ad litem lots of times, and it's someone's first or second case, or they they're doing it for you know mom or dad, being they've never done it, 
right? So I think communicating with them is super important. Give, give help, I send forms, do all the things. Um, and then explaining to your client what that other attorney is going to do and that they have to pay them. So make sure they know that. So the longer they sit with that attorney ad litem, if they're shooting the breeze, that's running their bill up. So make sure they know that's a paid position. Also get your AALC ahead of time. Make sure you get the invoice because sometimes those bills are too high and you might need to object to some of the things the attorney ad litem billed for. Um, and then make sure that the ad litem gets paid. So a couple of little topics of interest. We talked about personal service to the ward has to be a constable. Really important not to mess that up. Um, oh, and here's my here's my notes to myself because I always forget. So be sure these things are correct. Make sure that your proposed ward has a PCME dated within six months of the application. Make sure that on that certificate of medical exam, there's a little box that says, I waive privilege. I told this person that I was going to disclose the information they gave me. And that box has to say yes, or you have to call the doctor back and say, change it. You need to tell this person that I'm giving this information up. Make sure you ask the attorney ad litem if your client needs to bring their loved one to the hearing. Um, and then let's talk about determination of residence. Some of the, the physicians will say, I know that you have level four dementia, but I mean, if you don't want to live somewhere, you, we should listen to you. And they mean it really sweet and friendly and good, which is great until you've got a person who doesn't want to go into a care home and they've caught their house on fire three times, right? So it's important to make sure that the guardian has the right to determine residence and that you offer testimony to that effect at the hearing. And then look at the box at the bottom that says total or partial incapacity. It's hard these days to get a partial guardianship. So we wanna make sure we get a total guardianship. I have a guardianship case out in um, Jefferson County right now. And the doctor said partial incapacity. When I called her, she was like, oh gosh, she can't do anything for herself. She can't remember what she did five minutes ago, feed herself. And I'm like, why did you say partial? Well, I just felt bad. I feel like if she has an opinion, we should listen to her. She did, your doctors come from great places, but we need to make sure the form lines up with what the code needs us to do. And then if there are any notes or they say they've done like a mini mental exam, make sure you have it attached because the court's gonna wanna see that. And then, you know, reminding you that only a doctor, an MD can sign that PCME. It cannot be a PA or an MP. So some burdens of proof are important and we're gonna take away these constitutional rights. We've gotta do certain things. Um, for determining capacity, whether or not a guardianship is in the best interest and will protect your proposed ward or their property, that's just clear and convincing evidence. Does it seem clear to the court? Are they convinced, right? That's not a terribly high standard, um, but it is a little higher than say maybe the preponderance, which is it's a little more likely than not. But that's going to be for venue, whether the person who applied is eligible and entitled to act, um, and then the, the nature of the incapacity. So something to mention here that I didn't bring up earlier is if you are an attorney wanting to file a guardianship, you have to be certified in Texas by the state bar to do that. So there's a four hour course you have to take, and then you have to pay $25 and sign an affidavit that you did it. You have to be on the list. Um, fun, if you're ever doing a guardianship litigation, I always check my opposing counsel if I don't know them, because sometimes they just file that stuff and they don't know, and they cannot file, you cannot file anything substantive in a guardianship case if you are not certified by the state of Texas to do so by the state bar. And so always making sure that you are doing that. And then another second burden is that your, your guardian is going to have to be trained. There's a four hour training for them and a little certificate they get that says they've been um, trained to be a guardian. And if there's assets over, I think it's $50,000, they've got to get a background check and be fingerprinted. And so those are some of the extra things that we have to do. And if you are not familiar with that process, I actually have a memo, so email me. I've got a memorandum I send out that tells you as an attorney what to do for your client and then a letter to the client kind of explaining their part. And so my office usually initiates the training and fills in the court stuff. And then we tell the client, here's your login and your username and your password. We need you to log in, do the training and send us the certificate. And so I would strongly recommend 
you setting that up for them because they will mess it up and then you're going to be dealing with another governmental agency to fix it. They're wonderful, actually, but you're still dependent on other folks to step in and then help. So I'm going to end this and maybe perhaps unshare my screen if I know how to do it. Um, I was going to open it up for questions, if that's OK. Does anybody want to have a question that they would like me to answer? I have a question. Okay. Um, my question is that if we got anybody in here that's not an attorney and they are seeking a guardianship, um, can you talk a little bit about some of the policies as far as Fort Bend County goes and, you know, people filing their own paperwork, needing an attorney for certain aspects of guardianship, that sort of thing? So it is getting harder, I think, for families, unfortunately. You know, a lot of times the law changes because the bad people do bad things and it makes it hard for good people doing good things. So in Texas now, you really can't file in most counties for a guardianship without a lawyer. Because you are taking away someone's rights and because it is, it, the judges have so much liability, they, they want you to have an attorney to explain your role and make sure things are done correctly. Um, if you're an applicant and you have an attorney representing you, I think understanding that it's not gonna be super fast you know, I think especially in Fort Bend County, our judges, and they're wonderful, but they do a lot of things. These are not statutory courts. They hear civil cases, criminal cases, guardianship, probate. They have a lot on their dockets. And so getting court hearings can take some time. And every court really is a little bit different in how they want things done. And so I think being prepared for um, the unexpected is important. But I, I do think one thing that Fort Bend does so well is that the heart of Fort Bend County on guardianship is extraordinarily loving. These judges and their staff, they want to help you and they want to help your loved one. But if you are in a crisis situation, say someone's really needing urgent medical care and, and someone's not taking care of them correctly, you might need to utilize some other formats with an attorney like, like a temporary guardianship or you know, restraining orders but also just knowing how important it can be to get um, Adult Protective Services involved or to get um, the Health and Human Services Commission if there's a facility who's being abusive. Sometimes the ombudsman can be very helpful. So just having resources, um, and if you're not familiar with the ombudsman, I'm gonna spell it in case you want that name, it's O-M-B-U-D-S-M-A-N. And that is a person whose sole job is to investigate claims that happen like in facilities and with facility caregivers. So that you can sometimes get a better remedy through some of these programs um, if, if the courthouse isn't as fast as you want it to be. Did I answer that? Yeah, I think so. Any other questions? Yes. Robert, you can unmute yourself. Actually, let me go ahead and unmute everybody. There we go. Okay. Uh, you in the, in, the, in the event that a, two parents are parents are divorced, what happens? Do parents are divorced? One parent who has primary custody says, "You know, I I think child, I need to file an application for a guardianship." Does the does the other parent have to join in that application, even though both of them are divorced? Even though they're divorced? Well, they don't have to. But my recommendation, if the parents are joint managing conservators. And they have been co-parenting these years, right? Um, unless they agree and they understand they're waiving in favor of the other parent to their detriment. And I think we have to explain that, right? Um, they have a right. They they have they have equal standing to be that that soon to be adult child's guardian. And so now, if they're sole managing conservators, no. If you've got a a mama who's in prison and a daddy who's got sole managing conservatorship, no. But under the code, JMC, joint managing conservators, are both equally entitled. And I, I've i seen this happen more times than I would have expected, but people get real, real angry over this issue if they are just flippantly left out. And so I think it's something to really talk about. And that, you know, it's hard for 
if you guys have an agreed divorce decree and you're joint managing conservators, why would this judge consider something else? You've already agreed this is best, right? But what, what happens in the event that one parent thinks it's a good idea and one parent thinks it's a bad idea? Is that, does that ever happen or not really? So it can, I mean, sure, of course it happens. You know, when you've got the kid, you're doing your thing. And when I've got the kid, I'm doing my thing. But they've probably already been doing that and for a number of years, most likely. Okay. Okay, sounds good. But it can be problematic. If it's problematic and you have litigation, which obviously happens, we try to address those things in an order for guardianship, just like we would. Or, so, or we'll make one parent a guardian and the other one can have a medical power of attorney and a HIPAA. I mean, there's, there's, there's creative solutions, but just generally speaking, if they're JMC, they're both entitled. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Did you also say, go ahead, go ahead. I'll wait. Did you say that there's two designations uh, in order to serve one to serve as a guard, as a, a guardian ad litem? and the other one to serve, to be able to file an application for a guardianship? No, it's all the or same they... certification. It's all the same certification. So you can't serve as an AAL or a GAL unless you are also certified to file an application. And it's and if you or, earn the designation to be an AAL, then you're able to file the application. But obviously not for the same case, obviously not that, but you're able to do the, both of those. But you're able to do both of those things, correct? Yes. Yes, correct. Okay, that's all. Ms. Graham, thank you for the presentation. I'd like to get a copy of this PowerPoint and your guardianship memo. Could you give me your email address again, please? Yes, absolutely. It's Carrie. It's K E R R I at West. HoustonLaw.com. Thank you. Any other questions? I will send out the CLE information for this presentation um, to everyone that was registered um by the end of the day today um be aware that you will have to self-report it it'll have the CLE number and everything you need to self-report the presentation um and it is for one hour uh in CLE and then 0.25 ethics okay thanks Andrew So if there's not any other questions, we'll go ahead and in this presentation, of course, you've got Carrie's contact information. So if you think of something here before the end of the day, please let her know. Um, or if you didn't write it down for some reason, you can always contact us at the law library and we'll get you in touch with her. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Carrie, for uh, presenting. And we'll see you all next time. It was awesome. Thank you, Kerry. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Happy Thank Friday. You. Good. Thank you. Thank you.